Hello, Matt. welcome to Macro 2.0. With me today, as always, is Barry Nielsen from Opportunity Bank. We're uh, rolling along in our series of programs on big ideas, big institutions, big money questions. Today, we're going to talk about trade policy. Um, there's a lot in the news these days about trade policy. You know, we have a lot of uh, competitive challenges with China and the European Union. Globalization is a reality that everyone is becoming more and more familiar with, even if they're not happy with it. It's, it's a fact. And we're going to start with just a few of the big ideas that are sort of at the root of trade policy. As, as the world commerce has expanded over centuries, and countries are more interdependent, more interreliant. Um, globalization occurs in so many ways, in so many dimensions. Trade policy becomes um, a, a difficult challenge. So let's start kind of at the, at the beginning, the whole idea of, of free trade. The United States and the UK have been sort of champions of free trade and much of the world has, has joined in that philosophical uh, orientation to international trade. So I'm going to ask you, you know, what, what does free trade mean to you a as a person involved in, in finance? Well, I mean, a strict definition would be um, the free flow of goods and capital across borders um, without uh, tariffs, subsidies, um, and interference by governments uh, uh, or policy. Um, and I would say that, I mean, I think you gave two great examples already. The, the two most successful, I'm going to say this, the two most successful economies of the last um, 200 years, Great Britain and, and the United States, are champions of free trade. Uh, that should say something right there, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and, and our two economies have been linked for almost two centuries, you know, beyond uh, the conflicts we had with Great Britain when we became independent. Foreign investment from Britain basically built this country, you know, at least for a century, and much of the West. It's sort of a little-known uh, factoid about our own economic development. It was financed by British capital. So free trade is one thing, and, and as, as people will know from reading the newspaper and watching television, the United States is engaged in free trade agreements. Uh, we're we're current, constantly in negotiation of multilateral and bilateral free trade agreements, that is with one country at a time or with a multiplicity of countries at a time. A lot of controversy, controversy surrounding that now, most of which is focused on the notion of fair trade. So lots of people like to distinguish free trade, this unfettered flow of market forces with fair trade, which inevitably involves government intervention in the market that advantages one country or another, or at least is perceived to do that. So do you have a sense of what might be considered unfair trade practices, even within a free trade uh, rhetorical regime? What, what, what kind of interference is, is detrimental in your, in your view? Well, I think a strict economic view of fair trade or free trade is that almost um, without exception, any economist would tell you that um, free trade is, is the best way forward. It, it provides the most economic benefit to all parties in, involved. Um, when we talk about fair trade, I don't know exactly what we mean other than a response to uh, one government's uh, policies that might be anti-free trade or, or partially anti-free trade that are seen to, seen to benefit that particular country. So is, is that fair or not? Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I don't know if that's the distinction that maybe you're looking for, or, but, but at least that's my interpretation. Yeah. Well, I I see it pretty much the same way. Um, countries that aren't necessarily uh, in love with the fair trade principle or free trade principle, they endorse different kinds of, of policies. And I want to get to a few other terms that kind of emerge in the literature on this. One is 
protectionism and the other is mercantilism. And they're re closely related, but let's start with protectionism. You know, when, you, when people read that term, wh wh what's, what's being uh, spoken to when people talk about protectionist measures? What's being protected and how is that done in the global economy? Yeah, well I'm going to throw something out there kind of to start with and to facilitate our discussion. Um, protectionist policies um, might be politically popular or sound politically popular because they're, they're easily defined and it, it's, it's easy to see who benefits from a, a protectionist policy. For example, um, tariffs on the import of steel. Um, but the, the, uh, the bad things about protectionist policy are, are not as easily defined. For example, um, uh, I'm kind of strange, this might sound strange, but I, I have a favorite economist, yeah. <laughs> and that is, that is Milton Friedman. A lot of um, people will recognize that name. Sure. And um, he said that, I'm, I'm not going to get this quote uh, exact, but he said something to the effect that protectionist policies are called protectionist because they protect consumers from lower prices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I use that in, in the context of, of um, the, the benefits or the, the bad things about a protectionist policy are, are, are more diffuse and harder to define because, um, for example, if, if we impose uh, tariffs on some product that w we import from, uh, well, China's easy, an easy example, because yeah. the headlines every single day. Um, well, uh, there are uh, uh, negative things about that. One of them, them being that, that, that it uh, makes things that, that we purchase on a daily basis um, from tennis shoes to uh, iPhones to uh, computer components to televisions, whatever, more expensive. And, but but that's, that, that's diffused over a large number of goods, whereas everybody wants to protect the American steel worker. That's, that's easy to, to say, and, and, and are you in favor of that? Yeah, yeah, I'm in favor of saving steel jobs. Who's not in favor of that? But, but um, so it's easy to, to uh, see or to think that uh, a protectionist policy sounds good, yeah. but, but in reality, um, retaliatory um, policies against protectionist policies, well, well they have an uh, impact too, and, and those are harder to, to recognize. Yeah, well, I'm gonna back up a little bit, because when we talk about protectionism, as, as you've kind of already noted, with this example of steel, the American steel in industry is now getting protection from tariffs, taxes, on imported steel. So the benefits of that protection are concentrated on that one industry. Ab absolutely. The benefits of free trade, absent those tariffs or other barriers to trade that raise costs and, and tax imports, they are, they are diffused across the entire economy. So, I mean, that's one of the classic complaints that economists have about the arguments about free and fair trade is that in the aggregate, free trade is demonstrably beneficial to an entire nation. I mean, it's been proven upside, downside, every which way. Protectionism can work, can be very effective to protect a particular industry or cluster of industries from foreign competition. And I want to say that you know, I think I'm in agreement with you that overall most economists agree that free trade is better than, than protection or mercantilism. We'll get to that. However, there are many examples even in the 20, especially in the 20th century where countries in, adopted industrial policies, focused the government's attention and subsidization of key industries so that they could develop more rapidly and join you know, the advanced economy for, for periods of time that has proven to be successful. It was successful in the United States you know, in the 19th century, but as, as economies grow and emerge and become more sophisticated, I think the benefits of free trade are borne out and easier to, to demonstrate and prove out. But, um, well, I'm gonna- Go I'm, ahead, okay. jump right You and there. I always agree, and, I, and we're in agreement on this, but I might take a little bit of issue with that. Um, because I would argue that um, 
we as a nation, our resources should be allocated where they can compete most efficiently. So why would we protect one industry or why wouldn't we allow private enterprise to uh, take the lead and find a better way? Or, or if we can't compete with um, China on the, the, the production of iPhone components, who cares? Let them produce those and let them produce them cheaply. Our capital and, and um, resources will naturally find their way into another part of the economy, another industry, another um, sector of our economy where, uh, we, well, they, where they will be put together uh, or put to work uh, more efficiently. Um, I, I think that would be my, kind of my counter argument to, to, to that. Yeah. Um, Okay, I'll counter your counter just a little bit. With, you used the iPhone as an example, which is a great example of uh, a product that involves a, a global supply chain. There are many, many countries involved in the production of every single iPhone, each one making different parts of it in compliance with this principle that you bring up of, of, of you know, com comparative advantage and efficiency. It, it's much more efficient to produce the iPhone in, in a dozen countries than it would be to produce it in the United States or even in China. And so that in, an, in, a, in a way that iPhone is the, is the poster child example of the value of, of a, a, um, a cooperative market-based economy. And as you say, um, if the Chinese, or actually now the Chinese farm out so much of the labor to other Southeast Asian countries where labor costs are even lower than in China, but the end result is the iPhone we have in our hands, the, the brains that go into the iPhone, the engineering, the software uh, technology of, of intellectual capital, that is still rooted and planted firmly in the United States. And the value of those jobs the, the incomes derived from those jobs is so much greater than that derived from a factory worker, you know, putting a piece together. So, in a sense, I guess I'm I'm agreeing with you. I think you're defining it, comparative advantage, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's again, that precedes the whole notion of a free trade. That principle is what gave gave birth to the political example of free of free trade. Now. We're always short of time, and, and I, there's so much to talk about in this arena, and we're not going to get to a lot of it. But another thing that's uh, it's closely related to this, and this, this has to do with trade deficits. You know, the United States has a sizable trade deficit with just about everybody. Now, we do have a, a trade surplus with Brazil and a huge trade deficit with China, and it's an interesting contrast because the barriers to trade with Brazil are much higher than they are with China. <laughs> so there's so many uh, details that need to be plumbed out, but let's just talk a little bit about why trade deficits, as distinct from budget deficits, we know they're interrelated, but it's a different can of worms. The U.S. runs a very persistent, consistent trade deficit with most of its trading partners, meaning we are importing more goods and services, in many cases, from those countries than we are exporting. And the current administration is making a big deal about it, as if that's not fair. We should be on equal terms. We should have a balanced trade account with everybody we trade with. But there's some fundamental uh, problems with that approach. Do you want to start? Is, is this a good place to start about talking about trade deficits? I think so. I mean, it, um, it's a closed system. Um, the fact that well, a couple th points, I think. The, the fact that we import a lot of inexpensive items from everybody else in the world, again, that, that, that's a great thing for the American consumer. Um, that leaves more money in our pockets. When, when we can buy, um, when I can buy a, a dress shirt that was made in uh, Malaysia uh, for 20 bucks, and it, but if it were made here in the U.S., it, it might cost me, you know, 50 bucks because the, the difference is in the cost of labor. Yeah. That's, that's a great thing for me because now I have $30 left in my pocket that I can go and buy, out and buy something else that maybe was made in the U.S. Um, but uh, not only that, um, 
going back to, to, to your point about budget deficits versus trade deficits, um, it is in fact uh, the trade deficit that, that finances our, our federal budget deficit. Um, because when we send all, the, all those dollars overseas, and we, we per, everything we purchase in the United States, we're, we purchase with dollars, which goes back to um, something you already mentioned and something that we've, we've talked about in past programs, the fact that, that the U.S. dollar is the, is the reserve currency of the world. It's the currency in which uh, the vast majority of trade takes place. We have the advantage of being able to buy anything in, in the world that, that uh, we as a nation or a consumer want, and we pay in dollars. Well, one of the things that they do, uh, other countries do with those dollars when, when we, we pay them for the goods produced in their nation in dollars, they buy our U.S. Treasury bonds that help to finance our uh, federal deficit. So I, I, I'm not sure that we could run the uh, federal deficit and, and have accumulated the amount of federal debt that we have without a trade imbalance. So I say it's kind of a closed system. It, 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 it really is a closed system. Now, I kind of want to go back real quickly yeah. uh, to one thing I just said about the ex example I used in shirts. And maybe that's a really good example, because I read something the other day that um, it was talking about shirts, that we can't compete with labor in, um, you know, I use the example of Malaysia to, 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 to manufacture a dress shirt. Um, however, the great thing about that is it spurs innovation. And I think in the U.S. we are the, the leader in innovation. So this, what, I, what I had read in the example I'm going to use is some company had developed um, robotics to the point where there wasn't even human involvement <laughs> in the manufacture of a dress shirt. So now that company can manufacture dress shirts at the same cost here in the U.S. that, that um, it takes uh, you know, a person at a sitting at a sewing machine to, to do in Malaysia. So, you know, I, I think other countries that, that uh, put up protectionist policies, um, in one way, all they're doing is spurring U.S. innovation, and, and that's, that's a good thing, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm glad, though, you, you've kind of raised a double-sided issue. Th lots of people are not keen on foreign trade, especially our trade deficits, because they perceive that as the loss of U.S. jobs. You know, we've exported a tremendous number of manufacturing jobs to China, and that's a peculiar example. It's not a global phenomenon. And, and lots of the economies of the world have suffered the same thing. As you say, though, with the export of, of manufacturing jobs, we import capital back from China. Much of that is into treasuries, into finance, to prop up our, our budget deficit, but is also in the form of foreign direct investment, factories. A lot of workers in the United States, a huge number now, are employed by foreign firms who are reinvesting those same dollars that we paid them f to buy their stuff with. So as you say, it's the circularity of the system I is, is a thing to behold. Well, and you already said it. It goes back to colonial times where Great Britain financed the, the birth of our, our nation and made and helped us to, to become uh, you know, the industrial giant of, of the, uh, I'm going to say, 18th and, and 19th centuries that, that we became. Yeah. Um, and, and, and yeah, it's t we've talked about this before. It's tough as an individual when your job gets outsourced. But the, the, the economy as a whole can benefit, and, and you have to be able to adapt yeah. as an individual. But that's, that might even involve moving <laughs> from your beloved hometown uh, to take a job somewhere else where your skills are in demand. And that's tough. That's really tough. Yeah. That, that's why it's easy to say, uh, I'm in favor of that protectionist policy because it's saving my buddy's job and I don't want to see him move. That. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna swing back to the shirt because as you noted, the innovation that is created by competition. So we, now there are robots built making shirts at the same price as, as an imported shirt might be. So we are re-employing domestic uh, capital. There are far more jobs being lost to that very type of innovation than there are to 
foreign competition due to lower labor costs. I've been looking at this re in recent time. So a lot of people are led to believe that you know, the world is unfair, that we've been taken for a ride, that these, these trade agreements that we've entered into are, are just not to our advantage. It's rarely demonstrably true, but there is this grand dislocation that's always occurring because of innovation prompted by foreign competition and foreign trade. So the, the result of in the shirt business is that the people who have the brains to, to build and operate robots are now making the shirts instead of people in a long line, you know, in a garment factory. So that kind of, of uh, dislocation has a huge economic benefit attached to it, but somebody is left immobilized. And, and I, I take your point, you know, it's some people need to pick up sticks and go to where they can go. It's a, it's a difficult thing, uh, especially when you're tied to a mortgage or a, your health insurance benefits are not portable. There's all, so many other uh, things yeah, that kind of people keep people from being absolutely, mobile. It's not easily done. Yeah. No. Okay, the last thing, we're, we're out of time. The one other thing I wanted to address briefly is, is the balance of payments, which the balance of trade has to do with imports and exports of goods and services. The balance of payments involves the whole arena of transactions, you know, between one country, citizens and governments and entities and another. And I just wanted to bring this out because, because again, because we're the world reserve currency, because the dollar is what the dollar is and everybody wants to own it, have it, collect it, stash it, invest it, and have dollar denominated everything, we're the only country in the world currently that will never face a balance of payments problem because other countries have to spend their foreign currency reserves when they're out of whack. When they owe more than they, than they raise or earn, they have to bleed their, their foreign reserves. The United States has foreign reserves, but we don't need to use them because we can print more dollars and sell more treasury bonds and that sort of thing. So I just wanted to put that out there as another example of how important it is to have the, the reserve currency. It, there's risk associated with it, systemic risk, but it has so many benefits that make our economy sort of exempt from some basic rules of, of uh, deficit and, and, and surplus. Uh, you get the last word on this, a comment. Well, um, I, I won't claim expertise in that area, but you're, out, and we've talked about it now several times, it, it is, I mean, in the balance of payments area, I, I won't claim any expertise there. But it is such a, a benefit to the U.S. To, to be the world's reserve currency. And then we talked about them today. And, and to be able to issue debt in our own currency as opposed to um, having to issue debt, if you're another nation, having to issue debt in U.S. dollars and then have to, having to convert your local currency to U.S. dollars to repay that debt, that causes a, a lot of problems and, and, and has caused uh, uh, a lot of defaults uh, by nations uh, over the past couple decades. Um, that, that, is, that is a great ad advantage. Um, I think that, I, I, one last thing, and we don't have time to talk about it in depth, but something that goes hand in hand with, with, with free trade is, is the, uh, um, the free float of currencies. I mean, it is kind of a closed system. And when currency values are, are allowed to float in value relative to each other, it, it really balances out um, that that flow of trade and, and export surplus or, or, or versus a, um, a deficit in, 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 in exports. And, and over time, that adjustment in currency values also helps to, to, to even out that, that um, uh, trade deficit versus trade surplus. And, but it's when nations manipulate their currency um, and put up protectionist policies that, that it really kind of throws a wrench in the whole system yeah. for everybody. But that doesn't mean that responding in like with, with um, our own uh, protectionist policies solves the problem. It right. just adds to the problem. Yeah. One bad turn doesn't 
No, it doesn't. I mean, doesn't. you do another and hope things are going to get better. No, no. Well, as always, we've barely touched the surface of a big, broad, deep subject, trade policy, and next time we'll go a little bit further down this path and talk about some of the trade agreements that the U.S. is involved with, like NAFTA, or formerly NAFTA, and some of the big ones that we've sort of said hands off for the time being. So we'll just get a little bit into you know, the, the merits and, and risks of entering into trade agreements at different levels. So Barry, thanks again for being here today. Thank you all for watching. Join us again next time on Macro 2.0.